Is this why they destroyed the pipelines? Now, by now, you've heard the news. The pipelines that run under the Baltic Sea from Russia to Germany, they've been sabotaged, right? It's big international news, lots of speculation surrounding it. Who did it? Why did they do it? On and on and on. And while this is easily the biggest story in the world right now with massive global ramifications, it seems like the markets in the United States barely noticed, even though the largest act of war in decades just happened and threatened the energy security of Europe. Now, this is one of the most important geopolitical and economic developments in recent years. So in this video, I want to break down how we'll know who bombed the pipelines, who had the capabilities and the motives, what this means for NATO, Russia, Germany, and the US, what the Wolfowitz Doctrine, also known as the Defense Planning Guidance is, and what it said, and how this shows us what all comes next. So let's go. All right, welcome back. It is time to dig into one of the biggest events that we've seen in decades, maybe one of the most important events that we'll see. And uh, let's see if we can get to a little bit of truth. But more importantly, what does this mean for us? What's the takeaway? And so like I said, this is one of the most important events of our lifetime. And basically, we've seen Nord Stream 1, Nord Stream 2 pipelines have been sabotaged. We know this. Without a doubt, they have been sabotaged. This was not an act of nature. This was an act of deliberate intent. Now, these pipelines, they go from Russia to Germany. They move natural gas underneath the Baltic Sea. And this is a massive geopolitical, a massive economic development. And it makes the war going on between Russia and Ukraine even more dangerous and probably will continue to exaggerate this and drag it on. Now, we know it's not an accident uh, because of what happened. Now, we've seen seismologists in Denmark and Sweden reported there were large blasts. All right, now this ruled out earthquakes. It ruled out other natural explanations as well. Uh, side note, I was just in Mexico City about a week ago when that massive earthquake happened. I was on the 35th floor of a hotel and the thing was swaying back and forth so bad it woke me up at one in the morning. I never heard groans coming out of a building like I have before. It was insane. And of course, the seismologist picked up this earthquake from all around, from so far, similar to what they did in this blast. Now, like I said, it ruled out um, earthquakes, uh, other natural things that could have happened. And like I said, ultimately, and unfortunately, this really exaggerates the problems that Russia, Ukraine, Germany, and NATO are facing. Now, a couple of things that we want to ask ourselves is what kind of attack would it have to be? Who has the capabilities to do such a thing? Now, like I said, we know this was not an accident. It was intentional sabotage. So this would have required an underwater drone with explosives. I don't have one of those. <laughs> I don't know if you do either. <laughs> most of us don't. As a matter of fact, most of the world doesn't. It would, it would require what's known as an unmanned underwater vehicle, a UUV, and there's only a few armed forces in the world that have this type of technology. Those would be the US, it would be Russia, it would also be the UK Navy, probably the only few that have this. Now, the UK and Poland and Germany, they're all part of NATO, right? They're all NATO allies, uh, of course, and the United States. Now, because they're NATO allies, the UK, Poland, Germany, uh, the NATO allies, it would be very unlikely that they would um, launch any type of attack like this without at least coordinating it with the United States. So as a practical matter, basically, uh, you have to boil it down, it would basically be Russia and the US, right? So anybody else, uh, part of NATO would have to coordinate with the US. So let's just say it'd be the US or Russia would be the prime suspects in this. Now, of course, um, there's a video of President Biden in February stating, well, I'm not even going to say it. Let's hear it directly from his mouth. There will be no longer a Nord Stream 2. We, we will bring an end to it. But how will you how will you do that? Since the project and control of the project is within Germany's control. We will, uh, I promise you, we'll be able to do it. All right, now, what else? All right, well, we can look at motives, we can look at benefits, let's dig into a few. Now, there was a retired US Army Colonel, Douglas McGregor. Now, he said that a process of elimination rules out Germany. All right, now, uh, why would uh, Germany, who's dependent on the Nord Stream pipeline for their energy security, uh, why would they get rid of it? And like I said, it's all part of NATO and nobody would move in NATO without the US. So really it comes down to the US and Russia. Now, what about Russia? 
Well, it would also serve no benefit to Russia, right? Why would they have sabotaged their own infrastructure? Now, I don't know who blew up the Nord Stream pipelines, but I've watched enough murder mysteries. I've watched enough crime shows to know a couple things. Uh, that when you're solving a mystery, you look for motives. Now, when I look at motives, Russia has none, right? They could just turn off the gas. Why would they uh, want to blow it up when they could just turn off the gas and then turn it back on whenever they wanted, right? If, as long as they had that pipeline to turn it on and off, then they have leverage, right? Then they could say, hey, if you don't do what we want to do, uh, or if you do what we want, you want you to do, we'll turn it back on. That's their only bargaining chip. Why would they get rid of that? And of course, the answer is they wouldn't. They wouldn't give up the leverage of sabotaging their own pipeline. But maybe, uh, maybe we could say that, uh, you know, because the repairs could be done in six months, eight months or something like that, maybe Russia could say, well, um, you know, if we didn't want to. Let's just let them uh, have, some, have a little bit of pain and we'll get it fixed. It's a long shot. Maybe somebody could say in that, right? Uh, a slow show of force or something like that. Now, we did see former CIA director John Brennan. He came out and, of course, said, hey. Russia did it. But he also is the one that pushed the Russia interfered in the 2016 election. He also said that Hunter Biden's laptop from hell was probably Russian disinformation as well. So if by if uh, if Brennan is saying that Russia blew up the pipelines, it's pretty solid evidence that Russia probably didn't do it. All right. Now, who else? Well, does the U.S. have motives? All right. Well, if the U.S. blames Putin, right, it could have a reason to escalate the war in Ukraine, right? They're trying to get more people to support this, trying to get more reason to send them weapons. It also makes the EU more dependent on U.S. energy sources. Of course, now the U.S. is there to send natural gas to Europe to make up for what they were getting from Russia. Now, we also know the U.S. and other NATO allies want to sanction Russia, right? They want to sanction Russian banks, officials, um, the Russian central bank they've all been banned from the u.s dollar payment systems and also what's been sanctioned is high-tech exports to russia they've been banned we've seen all new investments in russia that's all been prohibited we've seen russian exports including strategic metals oil natural gas grain and other types of commodities they've all been banned and there's a few important exceptions right a few important exceptions which would be uh, russian exports of natural gas going to Europe. Hmm. So it seems like Germany was in this tough situation where, hmm, we either let all of our manufacturing base shut down, we dim all our lights, we'll let our people freeze um, and be cold, or we'll just continue to buy energy from Russia. Of course, that's not an option for them anymore, right? Something funny has seemed to happen through all of these sanctions. They haven't really had the impact on Russia. In fact, the Russian ruble is actually getting stronger today than where it was when the war began. Russia is making more money than it ever was in hard currency, not fake fiat, but hard currency for its exports of oil and natural gas to the tune of about $21 billion per month. Now, of course, if uh, the NATO allies, the G7, they don't want it, then of course, India and China, they're very happy to replace the customers that Russia lost. Now, the European Union has decided that it just needs to try a little bit harder, right? It just needs more sanctions, including a uh, what could be called as a Rubik's Cube idea for third party price caps. I don't know how that works. Somehow they're going to put a cap on energy that they don't control or buy. Um, somehow they're going to regulate Russian energy. They're going to enforce it by a secondary boycott of anybody who participates in the price cap scheme. Right Now, as far as I can tell, if I'm adding up uh, back of the napkin math here, I see that this is probably the eighth round of sanctions imposed by the EU on Russia. Now, what does this mean? Well, we may never know who done it. Maybe it doesn't matter. Now, I've seen some people speculating that whoever gets attacked first is probably who did it. Whoever finds out who did it, who done it, is probably going to have some retaliation. So maybe that's going to show us who did it. But we may never know. And maybe it doesn't even matter. What we do know is that this is going to exaggerate the tensions between the U.S., NATO, Russia, Ukraine, China, India, etc., as if we needed any more tensions. Now, something known as the Wolfowitz Doctrine was written in 1992. It's the Defense Planning 
guidance, which defined, quote, America's mission in the post-Cold War era. You might have heard of that. The Wolfowitz Doctrine goes straight to the point. It says that any potential competitor to the U.S. homogeny, especially, quote, advanced industrial nations like Europe, should never exercise sovereignty. It says, quote, we must be careful to prevent the emergence of a purely European security system that would undermine NATO, and particularly its integrated military command structure, end quote. Hmm. So we don't want uh, any of the European um, nations to have enough security that they would undermine NATO or somehow work against NATO. We would never want that, like having their own energy security. Yeah, we wouldn't want that. But look, the bigger picture here. I've been talking about three revolutionary cycles converging, political, financial, technological. If you haven't seen those videos, I'm going to link to the playlist here. You can go watch those. And this only shows that this three cycles is playing out. The world is breaking apart. History shows it. My three cycles tell it. And we can see this happening in real time. The world has been swinging like a pendulum towards centralization, globalization, and the pendulum is swinging back. Having a unipolar world where the U.S. homogeny and the U.S. dollar system reign supreme is coming to an end. Now, look, I love America. I bleed red, white, and blue. I got the Statue of Liberty tattooed on my arm. Doesn't change the fact that the world is breaking apart into what's known as a multipolar world. Now, I still believe that the U.S. will be the greatest nation in the world because we have all the natural resources. We have energy independence. We have all the arable land to grow our food. We have the ingenuity. We have the creativity, the production. We have the consumer base. The rest of the world doesn't have that. I can do a whole video on that. If you want, you can leave me a comment down below. But it doesn't change the fact that the world as we know it is breaking apart and will become much more isolated in more what I would call island nation states, smaller nation states, not cooperating like we have been together. What does this mean for us? It means that we have a lot more inflation in front of us. It means that as the world continues to break apart and we have more inflation because now we're having to re-onshore everything, it means that the central banks are going to have a very, very difficult time printing money. I've talked about all these things in other videos. If you want more, you can leave me a comment down below. But what we do know is that this cycle is playing out. These three cycles are playing out. We're seeing Germany and Russia that may have started to try to work together because of mutual dependence on each other. One wants to sell gas, one needs gas, just so happens. Now they're becoming more separated. Maybe this holds NATO together, but with the neocons, the neoliberals demanding war, and a man-made and a manufactured energy crisis that's threatening to freeze people in their homes and starve them of fertilizer and food. It's looking like it is going to be a cold winter either way. It's only going to exaggerate the problems that we have. It's only going to continue to break apart the world in a multipolar world, smaller world. And there's no doubt that we're living through interesting times, one that history books will be written about. Let me know if you think I have this right. Do you see the world continuing to break apart or do you think we miraculously all glue back together? Leave me a comment. Let me know. Am I out of my mind? Are we breaking apart? Are we going to stay together? Of course, as always, give me a thumbs up on this video if you like it. If you don't, you can give me a thumbs down. That's okay. But at least leave me a comment. Tell me why. Click on that subscribe button so you know when I put new videos out. And that's what I got. All right. To your success. I'm out.